And we're here for another historical discussion. Probably on our favorite subject. Musketry. Musketry. I could talk about musketry all the time. You do. <laughs> I'm like a one trick pony. Yeah. So let's talk about the evolution of musketry. Well, that's a good idea. Where do we start? If you were going to start, if you were going to talk about that transition from, we know we're, you know, we have the dawn of the rifle musket in the Crimean War. How do we get there? We start off with the unadorned tube of uh, Don't call round bass a tube. Round bass is the immediate, slightly more refined, slightly more better put together ancestor of the arquebus. <laughs> it is. And it's in service. And it's from it's the late less, 17th century. It's less reliable than the matchlock arquebus. It's about yeah, one really good flint. Flint. You do have a good flint. Yeah. Right now. Well, I don't believe you. It's gonna burn the house down. I might, I might, but <laughs> yep, yeah, there was a good spark. There was a good spark. I've been getting consistently good sparks from this. About one, one in three, between one and three, one and five out of that flintlock wouldn't go. Whereas with the arquebus, as long as you've got a good hot glowing coal in the end of your uh, match cord, it will fire. And you, the, you made match cord before. It's easy to make. Yeah, it's, it's, what is it? Soak, soak an organic rope in, in nitrate. And it just, uh, it will glow and burn for a time, and then you've got to blow on it to get a nice hot coal right before you fire. And that was the limit of the, the arquebus, or any match lock. Because you have to have an active, glowing yeah. flame to set off the charge. So if that goes out, you know, you can't just pull out the lighter and reignite it. You need flint and wool and steel and the, uh, the rigmarole of relighting in a pre-match or Rapid ignition system age. You got to relight your your slow match. So, so some of the grenadiers, even in the late 18th century, have this implement with with which to hold a uh, a coal. A, 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 yeah, a, a glowing uh, slow match. So that was the improvement of the flintlock, yeah. which was a, a descendant of uh, the the earlier dog lock, the Nicolette lock, various different attempts to harness the spark produced by a sharp stone, like an, either a pyrite or a flint against steel, produces sparks. And the flintlock is just a elegant system for a controlled producer of sparks most of the time. And we see the flintlock in British service until the 1840s. Well, well into the 1840s, well into especially the 1840s. In, in Afghanistan, long after the arrival of the percussion lock, it took time to distribute through. And also, the difficulty with the percussion lock, you only need one thing to fire this musket. That's it. Cartridge. Yeah. Because your powder to prime the pan is the same stuff that's going down the barrel for the charge. So you don't need a percussion cap. So for soldiers out in far-flung areas, uh, simplifies logistics at least surely but it uh but you need a flint right and you need you know to keep that flint secure and keep it uh keep it sparking so how long was this in service from the like, late 17th century years. until um about 1800 years long enough for soldiers fathers and grandfathers and, and great grandfathers to have served with the same weapon and we're almost there today in the modern army, in the United States Army, where our grandfathers, Vietnam War era, were carrying the M16, and we still are to this day. So there's a, some similarity there, but the question that we would replace it, or that something new or better would come along, and we have the same debate today. All of these new weapon proposals and new cartridge proposals, and they're hotly debated, and we end up sticking with the old tried and true. Yeah. And it was the same thing with Brown Bess. I think that's profound that the, when we talk about the advent of the rifle musket, all of the infantry officers 
and people that are involved in the starting of the School of Musketry or um, you know, adopting the rifle musket trained with brown bass. It was, it was all they knew. Bass. It was purely all they knew. Now keep in mind, for 150 years, this is all anyone knew. And it, it works well enough in a Western European where the fields and forests have been cleared and they start to get a taste of what the future is going to bring in the American Wars, in the French and Indian War and the American Revolution, fighting in a place where you don't have open fields because by the mid 18th century Europe, the, you know, as the British struggled to get timber for their ships because all of England, all the old forests had been chopped down and turned into charcoal and, and uh, ships long ago. Coming to the United States or what would you know the uh, North American continent and then outside of Europe, as the Europeans started to expand out of uh, out of the European continent, they realized these don't work very well. The British had a very hard time with brown bass in North America and in, uh, in South Africa, in uh, Afghanistan and India because the. Oldest, the enemies they were fighting did not always cooperate with them and, and form up into nice, neat lines per the Napoleonic Convention and fight them that way. So let's talk about the um, uh, principles of musketry behind brown bass. Why, why does it require large numbers in order to be effective? Well, because the ball is generously undersized, there's no real point in getting a tight-fitting ball. So it's a 75 under. caliber musket, what is the usual ball? Six, nine, five, okay. in, that, uh, in that vicinity. Because the ball, it's just it's bouncing out the barrel. And we have different, different opinions, different sources, conflicting sources about what musket range is. Because we know that a, a, quite a few sources call musket range up to and including 300 musket yards. shot. Optimistically, yes. And if you had a battalion of infantry and they fired a volley, they would have some effect at 300 yeah. yards. But and that's... if they know to elevate to a certain point. Right. Because yeah. that's, that's my party trick at the School of Musketry, that I try to aim at the same things with brown bass. And I can oh. get it over there. But it's the horizontal movement well, that always gets Consider that the, one of the chief instructors at the School of Musketry, Colonel Wilford, one of our favorite people, he said, his, uh, one of his uh, favorite quotes, is he's willing to stand 300 yards away from someone with brown bess. But he's, he's willing to be shot at from morn until dewy eve as long as whoever's shooting at him promises to faithfully aim every shot at him. Because he knew, <laughs> I'm not going to be hit if he aims at me. If yeah. he aims somewhere else, the chances of the random ball yeah. bouncing down and hitting me uh, are, are greater. So, you know, within musket shot is, uh, yeah. is within reason. But it's the same, the, the takeaway from Brown Bess is it is the same smoothbore metal tube of a matchlock. Uh, it's from the, the most primitive early firearms. It is the same, it's the same thing. The only thing that's improved is you don't have to carry fire with you. It produces its own, it's a fire lock. Yeah. It's got a lock on it that will make its own f ignition to uh, ignite the charge, so it's... And when do we begin to we talked about the, the transition to percussion. When does that occur? 1840s, okay. give or take. And what does that look like? Do we have one? Oh, do we? We do. Yes. Now we do. As of this week. Right? Oh, it's right there. Is it this one? It is. Oh, I forgot we weren't going to talk about that one not, until the end. Yet. Until the end. Yes, but so that this. Uh, it's a Model 1816 Harper's Ferry, smoothbore musket. It's a, an, essentially uh, a brown bess yeah. for all intents and purposes. It's, it's a 69 caliber, so the caliber is slightly smaller, but that started life as a flintlock. 
because you can see where the pan was yeah. once upon a time. And, but, and are these conversions, or was this, this made for the purpose? This is a conversion, so okay. this, the musket itself, model, uh, I don't want to say, was it 1804? Harper's Ferry musket, mm -hmm. uh, and then converted to percussion in the 1840s, perhaps early 1850s. Um, conversions aren't my era. No. But uh, extremely clever, simple, cheap, just drill the hole, put the nipple in, and voila, you've gone from percussion, or from flip-off to percussion. The rest of the gun's exactly the same. It's a smoothbore barrel, ball bounces out just as before. The only difference is that your ignition is considered, it's much more reliable, so yeah. you get 99 out of 100 shots go off instead of one, you know, three out of four. Yeah. Um, and, uh, Principles of musketry were the same. Colonel Wolfer would have been just as happy getting shot at all day from one of those as he yeah. would have read of uh, brown dust. And the Americans and the British, and probably on the continent, adopt that all around the same time. Generally. Yeah, because mm -hmm. the British one's P-39, and the, the P-42. Right. Well, the, the P-42 was purpose-built. That was purpose-built. Purpose -built. Yes, it was. So talk about that. Started. Uh, well, it was the first purpose-built from the ground up uh, British musket that was percussion. Uh, it didn't quite make it in time to go to Afghanistan, which I think we're gonna talk about it eventually. That's gonna be, it's, that deserves its own episode. Because I mean, that's, that could, there's a great deal to talk about, especially with the performance of brown bass in Afghanistan. Um, and it's against the non-European enemies that didn't yeah. fight them in the way who some of them still have matchlocks. And uh, in fact, they performed so well, and the British were so astonished by how, how well the Afghans defeated them for all intents and purposes um, in the, the retreat from Kabul, that they took an African, uh, Afghan Jizail rifle. Yeah. They took one home, and when they were developing the 1853 Enfield rifle, they tested it to see, to compare it to the ones that they were the, the, yeah. the best British gun makers and the, the Royal uh, Laboratory, the Royal Arsenal at Woolwich, tested their rifles alongside the, uh, the Afghan musket, and the Afghan musket performed right there with them. Oh, <laughs> okay. But, uh, you know, brown dust for its It has a greater reputation than it probably deserves because it was the heaviest, the most expensive, and it, it fired the heaviest ball with the least accuracy out of any of the contemporary yeah. European Compared to like the Charleville. Now, what just ingrained it in, in the psyche, especially the British psyche, was that this is the musket we defeated Napoleon with. And the, the power of British musketry, the British officers in the 1840s, 1850s, during the transition from flint to percussion, and when they start to think about the rifle, the answer that's given to these new proposals is that this is the musket that defeated Napoleon, and all of Napoleon's veterans, which are still alive, you can go ask them, and they say, it's the firepower of British infantry with Brown Bess that defeated us. That was what decimated yeah, our, not artillery, our not artillery, not bayonet charges. It was British, British led from Brown Bess is what defeated us. And it had that kind of immortalized status yeah. in the British army. That Absolutely. this is, this is the, this keeps England, you know, free from tyranny. This, this uh, 75 caliber, heavy, belching, browned, unadorned tube. I think that's part of uh, a great deal of things from the Napoleonic Wars, whether it's the musket or a first-rate ship of the line or a commander. If it had mm -hmm. service in the Napoleonic Wars, Britain has trouble letting go. And it didn't help that Wellington stayed on as commander-in-chief. And Wellington so directly was... influenced the rifle musket, didn't he? Yeah. With his requirements? He was not a fan of rifles for for a general arm 
okay. he had no problem with like the the rifles um, on the periphery. But for a general arm, he was he was very hesitant. Uh, he has a reputation of opposing it, which is not true. He did. Um, he approved the development of the first British rifle musket, the pattern 1851. Uh, the Brunswick rifle was a predecessor. It fired, That's a, the banded it, ball. it fired a belted ball. It had been around for quite a while. It was not very accurate. It superseded the Baker rifle, which was the flintlock that had been used in the Napoleonic Wars. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Brunswick was not a step really in the right direction. And that wasn't made to be the standard infantry weapon? Absolutely not. It was only for riflemen on the periphery okay. of the battle. And by periphery, I mean the flank companies, skirmishers. The rifle um, company. Right. Or it's, a it's rifle not, regiment. It's not every single, the, the battles and, and the battles were always to be decided by the fire of the line infantry with their, with their muskets. As late as 1850, they're saying that troops don't halt to play at long bowls with the enemy. They, it's battles will always be decided by the mass of the firepower of the line and by maneuvering on the enemy's flank. The same principles of Napoleon and and you know even earlier, you know, um, you know <laughs> Blenheim for that matter. Yeah. Um, but so what else does was does uh, the Duke of Wellington? How else does he influence? that transition from, you know, your, your brown vests, your conversion to the, uh, the P-51. Well, he insisted on the weight of the ball. And that was? His, well, his concern, and he's, again, often um, criticized because he insisted that the caliber of any new rifle for the British Army be of a, of a, fairly large size, or a one ounce ball, just like Brown Bass fired. And he wasn't entirely um, set in his old, old ways, because what he wanted the rifle to be able to do, any new rifle adopted for the British Army, was that in a pinch, that rifle could fire the old smoothbore round ball. So there's a little more, that he had kind of a, a larger intent than just Stubbornly insisting, no, the bolt, the bore of the musket has to be big so that it will knock an enemy over. He had a more practical purpose. Uh, mm -hmm. We've got, if we're going to start adopting more rifles, uh, the rifles should, in a pinch, be able to fit the standard. You know, and throughout the Crimea, we we don't see that that transition is complete. So we definitely had no, both right. in service, even in the same regiment. And so you might have had. Um, issues with mm -hmm. rifles needing to fire round ball. By the Crimea, the regiments would have been wholly armed with either rifle or smoothbore. The, okay. the four British divisions that went to the Crimea, General Cathcart's, the fourth division, landed in the Crimea still armed with the smoothbore. All the other divisions had been completely from top to bottom, every single regiment, every single company armed with the pattern 1851 okay. by uh, by the Crimea, but it was the it, it was a valid concern though, that if you got you know, and when Wellington was making this proposal, the Crimean War was still four years away. This is in 1850 when yeah. he's when this Committee on Small Arms is uh, testing new weapons and um, and all of this started because of the you know the holy trinity of the three. Frenchman, you've got uh, Delvin, De Tovenin, and Minier, and each one incrementally improved the ability to load a rifle just as fast as a smoothbore musket. So the the reason they didn't adopt rifles isn't because they uh, the smoothbore was so much better. The rifle takes so much longer to load. In the Napoleonic era, so when Brown Bess is running around, you had rifles. The British had rifles. The French, uh, Napoleon didn't have a, a taste for them. But they were around. They just took more time to load than they were deemed 
probably for a while. So a soldier with, with brown bass can get four rounds off by the time it takes a rifleman to load one. Um, and the early, those early flintlock rifles were two, three hundred yards. You had reliable accuracy and not much beyond that. But in the 1840s into uh, up to about 1850, the French, who, and it's ironic that Napoleon was not a fan of the rifle, yet uh, developments in England, you had um, a gunmaker named Greener, and you had a, a British officer, Captain Norton. Both of them invented a type of self-expanding ball. So by self-expanding, I mean when it's when the bullet is loaded in the barrel, it's a smaller size than the caliber of the gun. So if you've got a 75 caliber musket, the ball is, you know, 735. So it's undersized, so it loads very easily, but when it fires, it expands itself. Um, they both invented those, and they weren't accepted by the, the British authorities. But in France, you've got these um, brilliant French inventors working to solve that uh, the holy grail of military innovation, and that is a musket, a rifle, that you can load and fire as fast as a smoothbore. So uh, Delvine invented a, a breech that um, was chambered. So the very chamber of the bottom of the barrel was smaller than the size of the, um, the rest of the barrel. So the soldier had to take the bullet, drop it down the barrel, and then use a specially shaped rammer and the soldier had to ram it very hard, and that would squash the bullet. It would squash a round bullet into kind of a shape of an M and M candy. So it kind of go from a round ball to a squashed oval, and that physically squashed the bullet into the rifling grooves and took the rifling. It was a, not a aerodynamic bullet mm -hmm. uh, because it, it squished. And then De Tovenin invented uh, what he called the pillar breach, or the English called it the pillar breach, the French called it the TJ rifle, which is a stem or pillar. It's got a, a stem of metal coming up down the middle of the breach. You pour your powder down, the powder goes around this stem of metal, and when you ram the bullet, the bullet has a hollow base in it that when you ram it down, you give it a good firm tap that pillar in the middle of your chamber of the gun uh, forces the bullet to expand and so it fills the grooves and when you fire it, it takes the spin. Yeah. Um, but the problem with that is cleaning because you've got this piece of metal sticking up down at the very bottom of the chamber of the gun. And these are muzzle loaders. How the hell do you clean that? Um, but uh, of course Minier made the the only thing he did was he took all of these um, advancements and he theorized, well, do you really need the soldier to physically squish the bullet into the rifling with his ramrod? What if we make a bullet that will expand itself without any, all the soldier has to do is ram it and then you know, it doesn't have to squash it into any grooves or pound it onto a pillar breach. Um, and that's the sole contribution he made, was just don't bother with the chamber, don't bother with the, the pillar breach, just hollow out the base of the bullet and stick an iron cup in there so that when it fires, the iron cup, so the theory went. And this is still controversial to this day, by the way. People are fighting and you can go still on to arguments. message boards on the uh, internet forums and they're arguing over, well, what actually causes the Minier bullet to expand? And people, 2018, are still fighting yeah. <laughs> over this concept. It's kind of pathetic <laughs> to an extent. Um, but that was all Minier did. Um, but it and worked. that's still 7.0 caliber? For, for, for the, the mini for, rifle. For the British, uh, yes. The P-51. The P-51, which was a copy of the French rifle. The French came out with their the Minier rifle around 1850. 
and it caused a panic in England because now, um, and the British had stagnated their, the, you know, from Waterloo to 1815 until, you know, 1850, um, they had, you know, they're resting on their laurels so to speak, and the British Army had atrophied considerably. And this is our cue to recommend adding our French War Scare video to your playlist for mm -hmm. next. So, uh, but... Yeah, well, that's the, triggered, uh, to a large extent, the French War Scare. Yeah. But, uh, so Wellington requires that, you know, 7-0 caliber, um, right. And then we partly have out of tradition and partly out of we need to be able to load the common musket ammo in a pinch. Yeah. And I think that's one of the more interesting things that comes up and I think it, it has relevance in today's military, the military of any age. Oh, absolutely. Is, is the question of user error slash can you trust the common soldier? How much is the common soldier a professional? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, how much is he just someone that pulls the trigger because there are absolutely officers during this transitional period that think the common soldier cannot handle a rifle. Most of them, most of them did. Uh, there's a, a couple individuals that more than any other, especially for the, for the British, and the British were behind the power curve. Uh, the French were ahead in the adoption of rifles. Now the Prussians had already been running running around with the rifle since the 1840s. They had the, the needle gun. Um, Dreiser. The The Dreiser Jetsunarungewehr uh, in, in the German. That was a breech-loading, bolt-action rifle that they adopted in the late 1840s. And how did they solve the problem of gripping the rifling? They, uh, well, I mean, or did they not they even attempt it? No, they they the the bullet itself is is was the shape of an egg, okay. which is not very aerodynamic. But again, this is eighteen forties. No one really knows the best shape. No one knows that the bullet shape is the best shape for a bullet. Yeah. <laughs> so it's an egg shaped projectile, and around that they put a sabo of wood, and it was that wood that actually gripped the rifle. But because it was a breech loader, the the cartridge it resembled a, a standard paper cartridge and the soldier would stuff that in the breech of the rifle close the bolt pull the trigger and a needle um, several inches long went forward and it went through the base of the paper and it hit a percussion cap that had been placed in the base of the um, sabo of the bullet so it's you know something hard to hit against, uh, and that ignited the charge, and the wooden sabre around that egg-shaped bullet was forced into the rifling. So it was a breech loader. The problem with the needle gun was it leaked, um, it leaked gas. If you ever watch someone shoot one, you'll notice gas is vented forward from the breech. The Germans designed a clever system so that nothing would come back towards the shooter, but you can still see flame and smoke venting out of the breech of yeah. the needle gun. It had a very low muzzle velocity, lower than any rifle musket. But they're not attempting to use it as, to play at long bowls, as it were. You know, the advantage of, of the needle rifle, now the sights do go out to fairly longer range, but that parabolic trajectory arc, man, it's much harder to hit anything at long distance. Uh, the utility of the needle gun was you could load it just as quickly lying down in the prone as you could standing up. Um, but it wasn't fully adopted in the Prussian army until the 1860s. It was uh, far more complex to produce. Um, you know, it's a bolt action. It's got a complicated spring uh, needle system in it. Um, so the Prussians were still also using muzzle-loading rifles. Um, and it really doesn't, see, the, the world good. doesn't see it in use until they fight the Danes. Until 64, they fight the yeah. Danes. And then 66, they fight the Austrians. And then by 1870, when they finally fought the French, the French had a far better uh, a needle gun of their own, the Chassepo. Um, and the Germans still beat them because they, they, the, the Germans won those wars. Uh, Denmark 
you know, Denmark was just overwhelmed. Um, but they defeated Austria and they defeated France uh, because the Germans had developed much better mission command style uh, operations. Whereas the, the French and the Austrians were still stuck in a more Napoleonic concept. So the, the Germans beat them by just doing war better. The, the needle gun didn't, the needle gun was by 1870 hopelessly obsolete by uh, you know, European standard. By 1870, I mean, the British had already adopted the Snyder. Yeah. You know, a center fire, brass case, breech loading, we would identify that as thoroughly modern. And I think in California, now you need a license to buy this stuff. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's that modern. And the French, you know, the French and the Germans are still using these paper needle gun cartridges. Um, but the, the Germans out general them and out, uh, you know, to this day, the U.S. Army uses the German Auftrags tactic of mission command. But the British got hold of a needle gun in in 1850, and they even made their own copies of it in yeah. the Royal Arsenal at Enfield, and tested it as they're deciding what rifle, what type of rifle are we going to adopt for the British Army. Um, and they decided they didn't like the needle gun for all of these reasons. Yeah, the rate of fire is good, uh, which ironically was somewhat of a concern. Um, even bolt-action rifles, like the, the Lee Metford and the Lee Enfield, some of them had devices on them so that the soldier could only fire so many rounds so fast hmm. to slow down their, their rate of fire. Um, because the, the great fear was the soldier's going to fire, the nervous soldier's going to shoot his all, all of his ammo out very quickly, and he's yep. going to stand there helpless, and like, no oh, shit, what now? Um, it's going gonna to waste ammunition. But, you know, the needle rifle, um, it, good for volume of fire at fairly close range, and you can, and the great advantage of it is you can lie prone, and that enabled the Prussians to spread out and with their new mission command tactics, you could have the, a, the most junior lieutenant operate with some degree of independence with his platoon, whereas the Austrians are still waiting for orders, divisions sitting here waiting for orders that aren't coming, and they're just standing there like, well, we're waiting for orders. And, and they had been defeated by the French in 59, and they thought they learned a great deal from oh, this. Which we gotta do a video <laughs> on that. It's, 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 it's a discussion for a different day. <laughs> The poor Austrians I know, just they try to get a break. Yeah, uh, they learned they all the wrong so lessons hard. from Solferino. But uh, so let's get back to the the transition here, because I I think it is absolutely profound for these officers like Colonel Wilford that are experiencing that transition from Brown Best to, right. to the P fifty one and the P fifty three, um, where you have now this disdain for the smooth bore and um, sort of that that empowerment of the of the private soldier where now the private soldier is a professional he's it's to do paradigm shift it's an absolute paradigm yeah. shift because the uh, colonel Wilf wilford is saying you know the 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 soldier with brown best would turn his face away and pull the trigger. Mm -hmm. And for all the um, you know, reenactors and living historians out there that kind of call that a reenactorism, they probably haven't fired a live cartridge with the service charge. Because if you actually fire it was that ball with six drams, six drams which is nearly 200 grains, 200 and out, out, of, uh, grains of powder. out of this musket, most of the time, you are going to want to turn away. It, uh, it it's it's completely different than reenacting right. with it. And that well, that was one of the criticisms of Brown Bess was that its its charge was so heavy, its ball was so heavy. You know, it's a seventy five when everyone else is using a, a sixty nine. You know, but uh, and the British would say, well, that's so that if the enemy captures our ammunition, they can't use it. Our bullets are too big. Uh, but. But, you know, here your soldiers have to carry all this. But yeah, six tram charge. What it did do, 
or is it produced a flatter trajectory at closer range when you have that extra powder when you've got all of that powder and the ball the ball isn't touching the barrel it it bounces along the barrel so there's much there's much less friction whereas with a rifle the bullet is not just touching the barrel but it is pressure swaged into the groove of the rifle so to speak and it is also true that a naked bullet like the the american burton style um, what the americans will call the mini ball it, uh, the burton ball right it, but it, it, it's uh basically it's a mini ball without an iron cup yeah and that's the um, long and short of it and it was fired naked. Even the, the French, or the Minier bullet, was designed in a paper cartridge, to use a paper cartridge. And the uh, challenge was you have to lubricate the bullet. And uh, the lubricant is not really for helping you ram it easier. The, the lubricant is typically tallow thickened with wax, uh, with beeswax. It, coats the inside of the barrel as it is rammed down with the uh, the tallow so that it softens the fouling and so the next shot can help scrape it out so it's it enables the the gun to self-clean itself because the black powder of course is extremely uh, extremely dirty and if unchecked by this this uh, lubricant substance it'll build up in your barrel and then after a few shots you're done you know no more uh, no more shooting for you um, and then the Americans got around that to an extent by just dipping the whole dang bullet in. And uh, I don't know if you can see, this is a, a US style dirty cartridge. cartridge. But you see where the grease on the Bleeding bullet right has through. already started to go through the paper? Yeah. That would happen if, uh, if the, the grease is right around it. This probably just put a few miles in inside the truck. Yeah. <laughs> But, uh, I mean, that would happen on a warm summer day in yeah. Pennsylvania, marching around in July, 109 degrees out. Um, your ammunition is going to, the lubricant is going to start to melt off your bullet. Um, but the, uh, you know, between a rifle and a smoothbore, the smoothbore has a flatter trajectory at close range. Now, the disadvantage is you can't really, like you mentioned, your um, your left and right is all over you know, the place. All over the place. But your windage is usually pretty, or your elevation rather. Your windage is all over the place. Your elevation generally along a, a straighter line because the bullet is going. It, its its lateral movement is greater than its uh, its up and down. But there's no friction with a, a rifle bullet. The naked bullet has less friction in the barrel than the paper patch. The paper actually does more friction, so the uh, you get a rifle. So you've got the 1853 Enfield. This is my, my beloved first model uh, with sights that go up to you know, 900,000 yards. And this is the one that went to the Crimea. This, this rifle almost certainly went to the Crimea because um, it, it's a first model infield and it's got that delicate curl to the hammer. Um, it's, it's an artistic touch, you know, back before weapons became just pure um, all business. Now there's no artistic beautiful curl to an M16. <laughs> it's, just, it's just plastic and yeah. aluminum and ugh. Um, but they, there's still decoration and, yeah. and engraving on it and an artistic touch to it. I, uh, so let's talk about, we, we got the P-51. What is the P-53? What is that? What are, what are the changes between the P-51 and the, the P-53? The P-51 is a copy of the French Minier rifle. It's the first, uh, it, and it's in 702 caliber so that you can, in a pinch, you can shoot the 69 caliber ammunition for brown bass, although after a couple shots it didn't matter because the 702 barrel fouled quickly. Um, but it was a, um, 
hasty process getting the 1851 uh, adopted and they waited until you now um, I want to say Wellington died in 1852 but within a year they already had a new rifle because they understood that they and they called this a small bore yeah it's a 577 bore and it was small bore but you probably can't see but for those of you that want to zoom in, it really is a profound difference between it is, you know, sh that. Uh, show the, the bottom. That's <laughs> from that's from seven oh two to uh, five seven seven. You know, this this is a small bore rifle, right? but the soldier can carry so much more ammunition. Yeah. Uh, the smaller bores were um, more accurate. They went from a four groove to a three groove rifling. And it, uh, it is remarkable that they, they came out with this, uh, this rifle for a pattern 1853 very early, among the earliest of all the uh, most commonly encountered rifle muskets. So 1853, you have the, the British rifle that would serve all the way until the late 1860s when the, the Snyder conversion replaced it. There's another conversion story. But it's... It stayed in that frontline service. Uh, the Americans, you know, the 1855 rifle with the Maynard tape primer, then superseded by the 1861 Springfield, and they improved upon that with the 1863. Well, they didn't so much improve it as they made it even cheaper and quicker to yeah. manufacture. The Austrians with the 1854 model Lorenz, but the 1853 infield still it was the first and it held its reputation up to the very end of the muzzle loading era it was the the apotheosis of the muzzle loading rifle and it was among the earliest adopted by the major powers i think that's stolen from my forward in your uh, in your book the Probably. apotheosis of soldiery that's what i called it yeah. Well, it uh, for for muzzle loading technology, it was it yeah. was a small bore. Now they did make some even further improvements to uh, for accuracy. What they could never get to do. So here's an infield cartridge made of that uh, uh, typical paper cartridge, and the the bullet was loaded with the. Paper still around the ball, so it was a paper patched uh, cartridge. They never did quite get the Whitworth rifle off the ground. It was a, a even smaller bore. It's a forty-five, and it had Whitworth's patent hexagonal yeah. rifling, so much more accurate than the government standard infield, and uh, they wanted to adopt it, but the uh, it's great for sharpshooters and snipers on the periphery, but for a general service, and here's a, a Whitworth cartridge uh, with its. It's got a trap, a fun little trap, a trap door. door in it, so that you'd uh, um, because the bullet. The problem with the Whitworth is you couldn't uh, reliably paper patch the hexagonal. Version. So they had the cartridge where you'd stick it in the muzzle and you'd tear off the, um, the trap door and the powder would fall. Then you ram the bullet down through That's why we can't right have nice through things. the cartridge. And then you would just discard the, the external yeah. um, housing. And these even saw use in the American Civil War. They did. The Confederates bought a few. They were very expensive. Yeah. But uh, every now and then they find Whitworth bullets. If uh, um, you look for the Doug metal detector recovery bullets, um, that's like the holy grail of uh, relic finding, though. Um, so this almost certainly went to the Crimea. Now it's interesting. This has an 1854 dated lock. And so it would have been, this is among the first 20,000-ish 
first model Enfields made and they were all sent out to the Crimea as quick as they could make them. Um, but they couldn't make them fast enough. Um, so, so that's kind of the last iteration that we have to talk about is, is that, is. that Regression, progression, I don't know what else to call it, is when you, uh, you rebore all those extra muskets you have. Let's talk about mm -hmm. that. It's a rifle, pull out, uh, rifle P42. Pull out this. Get this. All right. Now, this is still oozing oil because it. Uh, now you just got There's this a lot this week. Of rust in the bore. This but you just got this over, this week, right? Yeah, it sat over someone's fireplace for probably a long time. Um, but so this is one of those. Um, this is purpose built for percussion. It was. This is a pattern 1842 yeah. rifle musket. So this is among the but first. But it's still very recognizable as. Brown bass. If you didn't have the sling, it would look, you yeah. can see the, the, you know, the, 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 the house and the, uh, the, for the ram. English insisted, even when they made their needle rifle for testing, the Germans were using barrel bands and they made one with a yes. keyed and pinned barrel. Yep. Um, so the same keyed and pinned barrel as brown bass, the same ramrod channel and, and pipes for the uh, rammer. Very Instead unique bayonet system though. The, yeah, the uh, Lovell's patent um, bayonet. But in the, with the emergency coming up upon the Crimean War, they took the old pattern 1842s and rifled them. And this poor rifle has had the rear sight knocked off at some point. I'm almost suspicious by the, how the the barrel has been scraped and you can even see, I think they may have done that on purpose to display it as a, they wanted like an example of brown bass or something, yeah. so they took the sight off. Um, they, they should be murdered. But uh, originally it had a sight that went to a thousand yards, the same sight as the pattern 1851. But it's a 758 caliber rifle and it's got four groove rifling, but that is an enormous caliber. The seven five And there are seventy eight. there are seventy-five caliber mini balls for that. Yes. Um, under they were undersized, but the uh, they had the iron cup and then later the wooden plug just like the other rifles, and they primarily issued these to the Marines and the Navy. The Navy liked them because they, they wanted that, that bigger bullet to smash through the boats of uh, enemy sailors coming to board them. So they wanted a very heavy ball yeah, they wanted the that would caliber. penetrate through the, the boats of the enemy sailing up on them. Um, and the Marines at Balaclava probably were armed with uh, the rifled pattern 1842. And I have to imagine that um, some of the Ottoman units probably got rifled P-42s rather than handing them perhaps P-53s. Uh, but the, you can tell the difference between the cartridges. Between It's a 54 Lorenz cartridge with a compression bullet. And <laughs> this is like a piece of artillery. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> it's very light artillery. It's great. It was loaded the same way. It was unbelievably large. <laughs> yeah. So that's kind of the last iteration it's, with the uh, it was it was a, a regression, but we're taking what we've got, yeah. and they weren't the only ones. Uh, a lot of older smooth bores were bored out. The Americans did the same thing with them. Our model 1842 smooth bore bored out in 69 caliber, and that's actually what this is 69 caliber Burton style bullet for the bored out model 1842. And I'm sure the French also needed to rebore a lot of their um, smooth bores oh, yeah, with the numbers cheap. they brought to Crimea. It's cheap, it's, uh, it, 
it gives you a rifle for um, using pre-existing stocks. Uh, what it causes you is a logistical problem because yeah. your ammunition doesn't doesn't match. Um, but uh, but it sees use in the Civil War. Relatively right? few were made. Oh yeah, after after the, the, the Crimean War, the the pattern eighteen fifty ones and the rifle eighteen forty twos. Once the British started getting the P fifty three Enfields, these were um, a lot of them oh, sat in stacks. This is the, old the hat. Tower. They stuck them outside the tower in piles in, in outdoor. I wonder, I wonder if this lived outdoors I, at the I, tower. I hope not, but judging by the rust, I mean, it might have lived outdoors. It very well may have. Um, and then here, you know, 1861, 1862, here come these Confederates. Um, <laughs> you know, yeah, what you, what you all want there for them piles of muskets? <laughs> they were just sure. sitting there. They're like, hmm, no, I suppose we could part with them, you know, for the right price. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's ironic that most of them, in fact, in uh, in uh, Dr. Rhodes' book, in, by 1861, there were only 11 pattern 1851 rifles left in all of the British Isles. They had been either relegated to colonial service, or as in the, the vast majority of them were sold to the Confederates, who called them... And they called the P-42s, oh, they no. called them rifled brown besses. I hate that. And they were not very popular because sure. the size of the bore and the recoil. Yeah. This is a brutal rifle to fire. The Marines hated them because of the, the recoil. Originally, the charge was three and a half drams of powder. So, uh, Not quite six. six. Not quite six, but again, it's still a rifle. And then they realize that two and three quarters give you even better accuracy. So eventually they reduce the powder charge um, for better shooting out of the old rifle 42s. But it's an interesting life. This, this, this exact piece started its life as a smoothbore and it was only ever intended to be shot in volleys by soldiers that have been run through the motions of how to load and pull the trigger upon order and the same physical piece was transformed into a rifle with sights that went up to a thousand yards the same gun went from not being able to hit colonel wilford at 300 yards you could shoot at him all day as long as you promised to aim at him yeah then the same gun itself is rifled given a sight and now you can reliably Engage targets out to four or five hundred yards, and then area targets out to a thousand yards, and it's the same gun. So the this, this was now. a witness to that paradigm shift. It is the paradigm shift from smooth war to, you know, it's it's large and it's got that four groove, slow twist rifling in it, but. Uh, for the soldier, they went from the old era of warfare to the modern with the same piece of iron and wood. It's kind of yeah. ironic to think about. Um, uh, musketry. That's musketry. So I think that's, uh, we'll probably call it a night for the transition between uh, brown bess and the rifle musket. Indeed. Although, if people want to know more... I was going to say, you're you probably too go. humble to plug your own book, but... Well, you can plug but, it for me, then. But, uh, <laughs> The Destroying Angel, the rifle musket is the first modern infantry weapon. Your, uh... Your book on... The, guys the adoption... Crack. The adoption of the P-51, P-53 as that first yeah, the modern infantry weapon. More significantly the impact it had on the soldier. We're still in the we're still in the rifle era. Yeah. We're still in the same era as this clumsy looking piece of wood and iron. Soldiers today, the infantry are still in imagine the uselessness of a smooth bore yeah. M sixteen. Uh, and we're today individual soldiers 
engage their own targets and they're trained to be marksmen yeah. with their weapons. And the infantryman is a professional today as he was in Right, because he, he has to be trained up to uh, his weapon. Yeah. All right, the Good Destroying job. Angel. We hit, The link is in the description. Only $12. And it, it's 11 if it's signed, right? We'll send it back to you? Yeah. All right. Sure. <laughs> Thanks for listening.